1913, the year of peace before the slaughter of the Great War, a time of endless laughter on the riverbank, with men in striped blazers and ladies with flowering dresses. For a section of the population, this was true. Yet we forget the rise of the suffragettes, widespread industrial strife in the UK and the possibility of civil war in Ireland. Revolutions in China and Mexico together with a war in the Balkans. St. Werberg's is a quiet residential neighbourhood in the northeast of Bristol and is a popular place to live. But it has its fair share of tragedy, as James will relate. What is so extraordinary about murder is the sheer banality of it all. Ordinary people living ordinary lives, yet capable of the most heinous of crimes. Our story involves two such people from Bristol named Ada James of Union Road St Phillips, and Edward Palmer, commonly known as Ted, who resided at Albany Place, Montpellier. Ada attended Bible classes, yet was a regular drinker, and had an interesting sex life. Ted, on the other hand, was also a heavy drinker, and at one time was a boxer until failing eyesight led him to abandon the ring. Being a pugilist and a frequenter of less salubrious bars, it comes as no surprise that he got into fights. However, there were signs that he was unbalanced. He frequently wore a revolver and actually threatened to use it on his own mother. At one stage, he went to seek his fortune in Canada, but left after a year to return to Bristol. Prior to the fateful day, Ted had been told by two sailors that Ada had been on the game during his absence. The day before the meeting with Ada, Ted bought a second-hand cutthroat razor for 10 shillings, or 50 pence, in today's money. On Monday the 27th of January 1913, Ada attended the Bible class annual dinner with her brother, Alfred, at the Shaftesbury Crusade, a mission hall run by volunteers from Redland Park Congregational Church. An hour or so later, she returned home, where Ted was waiting for her, and both decided to go for a walk on Narrowway Hill. Witnesses reported that their conversation degenerated from cooing lovers to what is nowadays called a domestic. At about 8.30 in the evening, Frederick Fry, a stonemason, nearly tripped over some clothes as he crossed from Lymouth Road to Minor Road. On closer inspection, he glimpsed an unconscious body of a young woman whose face was covered in blood. He ran to a local shop to fetch us some water. Whilst he was away, another couple almost stumbled on the body. The man was P.C. Parfit and could see that Ada was regaining consciousness. He found an old envelope and a pencil, and Ada wrote the four words that would send Ted to the gallows. Ted Palmer, Union Street. Her throat had been cut, and she was to die in the early hours of the morning. P.C. Parfit used his initiative and followed bloodstains to the corner of Lynmouth Road, where he found a woman's ring. This would become more important later in the story. In the meantime, Ted was wandering around Bristol after purchasing some stationery and laudanum, which is a mixture of opium and pure alcohol. It is presumed that these purchases showed an intention to commit suicide. He then decided to go to his uncle's house, but was apprehended by the police on the way, who escorted him to Trinity Road Police Station. One of the extraordinary aspects of researching vintage murders is the number of times the culprit does help the police with their inquiries, even though there is no remission for their efforts. Ted certainly helped the police with their inquiries. He claimed that he was dissatisfied with living in Bristol and would try the West Indies to seek his fortune. Given that he had just got back from Canada with no money and wanted to go to the Caribbean, which in 1913 was a backwater full of ex-slaves, Ada was unimpressed at the thought of joining him over there. She had lost her temper and threw the ring at him. In addition, she supposedly uttered the words that she would go on the town, as she put it, as she had done this before. As they say in the good book, she was some sort of Jezebel. At this point, Ted could not help the police with further inquiries, as, in his own words, 
everything went black, and he could not remember cutting Ada's throat. He was remanded in custody until the 19th of February 1913, when he was tried at Bristol Assizes. Ada was laid to rest at Greenbank Cemetery, in front of a crowd of 2,000 mourners. The vicar described her in his sermon as a godly and virtuous woman. It was alleged that her father made a considerable amount of money allowing people to see her corpse in the front room of his house. Whilst in custody, Ted spent many hours composing letters to all and sundry. He wrote to Ada's father, contradicting the words of the minister and claiming that she had become pregnant and Ted had to sort out the problem. In it, she was now a respectable married woman. He mentions a marriage, but there are no records. The one to his mother was damning, as he wrote, In a flash I turned on her, more like a wild animal than a human being. The presence of the razor presented a problem. The defence claimed he had lost his old one. Ted's younger sister said that he had crept into her bedroom whilst drunk and threatened her with it. She had hidden it, hence the need to buy another. But there was a flaw in this story. On the day he bought the replacement razor, he tried to retrieve his revolver from the pawn shop, but did not have sufficient money to pay the ticket. At the trial, there was talk of intimidation of witnesses. One of them, who saw them quarrel, was threatened with violence if she took to the stand. On the 19th of March 1913, he was woken at 6.30am and led to the gallows. The executioner was the famed Thomas Pierpoint. The prison governor noted that he was brave to the end. Interestingly, he had actually lost a stone during his time in captivity. Usually the condemned man would put on weight due to more food and less exercise. The importance of weighing the condemned man cannot be underemphasized. Modern hanging techniques use a method called the long drop. If it is too short, the man is strangled. And if it's too long, the head is decapitated. Now, John, a very gruesome tale. What is your opinion? The only person who could save Ted Palmer from the gallows was the Home Secretary, John Simons, in H.E. Asquith's cabinet. Whilst today he is an obscure political figure, he actually had an interesting political career as Chancellor of the Exchequer, First Lord of the Admiralty and Home Secretary. He was reluctant to move from the Admiralty to the Home Office, even though the latter was and is a great office of state. Bear in mind that he had the use of a grace and favour yacht called HMS Enchantress with a crew of 196. If you think that today's politicians get too many perks, think again. As Home Secretary, he was responsible for two key pieces of legislation. The best known is the Prisoners Act, temporary discharge for ill health, commonly called the Cat and Mouse Act, which permitted suffragettes on hunger strike to be released on licence. This was intended to reverse the previous decision to force-feed suffragettes on hunger strike. It did not really work. Another priority was his role in the Welsh Church Act, which disestablished the Welsh Anglican Church. To modern folk, this would seem trivial. But this is to view history solely through modern eyes. Most of Wales were nonconformist and bitterly resented the payment of tithes to the Welsh Church. They were supported by the Liberals and bitterly opposed by the Conservatives. The bill to disestablish the Welsh Church was defeated in Parliament in 1886, 1892, 1894, 1909 and 1912. This bill took up a significant amount of his time. There have been sightings of a ghost as testified by certain mediums. The actual evidence is inconsistent as the only photograph is one of Narrow Ways Hill with some brown haze in the middle. But we have set views of ghosts or aliens, as they have eyes like humans and speak English. Laudanum. It conjures up 
to modernise an image of a 19th century literary figure, dreaming up fantastic images along the lines of Samuel Coleridge or Thomas de Quincey. Certainly true, but misleading. Opium has been around a long time, and there are scholars who believe that Homer alluded to it. We think of it as the preserve of avant-garde literary types and degenerates in Limehouse's notorious opium dens. No, it was used widely by everyone and was part of the family medicine cabinet. It could be used for anything from diarrhoea to getting children to sleep. Until the 1920 Dangerous Drugs Act, you could order it over the counter at any chemist. <laughs>